This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Notice, Christ counted him faithful. You see, he not only put his faith in Jesus Christ, but God entrusted to him the ministry of being an apostle, which means, in a sense, he counted him faithful. He knew what he was doing in Paul's life, and he even knew what he was going to do and how Paul was even going to respond down the road. And he says, this is an absolute tribute to the grace of God. And so when someone is faithful, indeed, you can be thankful for that servant of Christ, but realize it's all by the grace of God. And by the grace of God, you're faithful, and make sure you don't believe your own press clippings, that you give glory to God. Now, part of this faithfulness involved Paul having a good conscience. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, it says, for this is our confidence. The testimony of our conscience is that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you with God-given sincerity and purity, not by fleshly wisdom, but notice again, by God's grace. Now, it is very important to have a good conscience. A good conscience is a cleansed conscience. A good conscience is a scripture-filled conscience. A good conscience is one in which you've stored up norms and standards of the word of God in your thinking, and you're not violating them. You're walking and living in light of that. Can you say that about how you've conducted yourself, that you have a good conscience? Now, you might be deceiving yourself unless you are self-evaluating or judging yourself based upon the word of God instead of your own feelings because every man is cleaning his own eyes but the Lord judges and weighs the heart. And in fact, in the decisions you make, you're making, could I, if I came alongside of you and said, why did you do that? Would you say, well, I have a good conscience because of this principle or because of this verse? Can you even think in those terms? Or is it just you're just operating based on your feelings? And you're just going the way of the world or operating based on your flesh? Or, hey, I see other believers doing it. What's the big deal? But what are you thinking? What is your conscience? Do you have a good conscience before the Lord? You know, in talking to someone recently, he was just so honest. I just loved it. As we were discussing this issue, he says, yes, I understand that. In my mind, though, I keep trying to find the loophole. <laughs> I thought that was so honest. I'm trying to find the loophole. You know, when you know what the will of God is, do you constantly try to find, but what's the loophole here? What's the exception clause? How can I compromise and come out smelling like a rose here? Now, if you think that a mere knowledge of the word of God, as important as it is, is an end in itself, think again, because while you're in 1 Timothy, look at chapter 1, verse 5. Now, the purpose of the commandment is love from a good, a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. Now, sincere means an unhypocritical faith. In other words, we can put on masks. You know how you're doing? Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm doing great. I'm walking on cloud nine. And then if people really knew what you were doing, a whole different story. Oh, I'm just trusting the Lord. In fact, I'll tell you this. Sometimes I talk to believers who are making overtly bad decisions. And when I talk to them and say, I just want you to know, Pastor, I've never been so close to the Lord. I finally looked someone in the eye one day and they said, they all say that. A 
a good conscience. But you see, the objective isn't just to know truth. It's to implement truth. It's to apply truth, the word of God, so that it issues out in love towards the Lord and genuine love for one another. But again, that love has to be within the parameters of truth. So we see later in this chapter, in verse 18, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. And by the way, pastors like Timothy, including you as a believer, you are in a spiritual war. And you need to have your armor on. And you need to have your head in the game. Verse 19, having faith and a good conscience. There it is. A good conscience. Having faith. Having faith in the Lord, having the word of God, and a good conscience. That's how you get a good conscience. Which some have rejected. Did you know that? Some have rejected the faith and therefore don't have a good conscience per se. Concerning the faith, they've suffered shipwreck. Now, I want to just say something. There are those who teach that if you're genuinely saved, you will persevere in the faith all your life or you weren't really saved. Here, it's very clear. These individuals shepherds suffered shipwreck of their faith. Question, can you shipwreck a ship that doesn't exist? To shipwreck your faith means you had to have faith to shipwreck. And what happens with believers who faithfulness isn't the bottom line, they get a personal beef or they get bugged about something, da-da-da, and then they start going to a church and that isn't sound in doctrine and they're willing to overlook that you know, they strain at a personal gnat and swallow a doctrinal camel. And then as a result, what happens is their faith gets shipwrecked. They start believing things and whatever that they never would have had they handled it correctly. Now, he even mentions the teachers, Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan. I excommunicated them out of the church so they'd gag on Satan's world, as it were, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And the word learn there is word for child training, clearly indicating these were believers who were experiencing divine discipline. And by the way, when you think of divine discipline in the rebellious believer's life, there's the sin unto death in which God sometimes takes believers home right to heaven and say, in essence, you'll do more good for me in heaven than you do it on earth. You're coming home now. But did you know the second greatest act of divine discipline in the early church was to be put out of the local church? Do you know how important the local church is? And that's what happened here. Delivered to Satan is used that way in 1 Corinthians 5. You see, there is a lack of doctrinal integrity and faithfulness to the Lord. And eventually their faith became shipwrecked. That's why sometimes you talk to people who maybe even were raised in Christian homes, and you talk to them and they have abandoned the faith in many ways. It doesn't mean they weren't saved. It means they weren't faithful. It means they didn't keep abiding. It means they started sucking in the world's thinking. And pretty soon, they were places in their thinking you never thought they would ever be. And you know, even as a parent, I have no greater joy than to know my children walk in truth, John says, and you have no greater pain in some ways when they don't. Because your kids do have a volition. Regardless of how faithful you are in training them. And you want them to understand and even taste and see the Lord is good at a young age. And keep tasting because it's a day-by-day -day battle. Now, while we're in 1 Timothy, go to chapter 3. So we think of faithfulness. It's important, obviously, that spiritual leaders are faithful. They need to be godly men with personal and doctrinal integrity. Now, elders are described, the qualifications thereof, in verses 1 through 7. And now we begin deacons in verse 8. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Notice they're holding fast. They're faithful to the mystery of the faith, the word of God, and they do it with a pure conscience. Now, it doesn't mean they've never screwed up, but it means when they screw up, they get it right. They get it right with the Lord and get it right with others. 
Again, we're not demanding perfection here for qualifications for a deacon. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any deacons. We wouldn't have any pastors. We wouldn't have anybody. Because we all are in the process of growth. But there's a way to handle it with integrity. Now, it's interesting to note verse 10, but... But let these also first be tested to see if they're faithful. Then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Now, blameless, again, doesn't mean perfect. It means they're faithful. They don't have legitimate handles to grab so that people can legitimately criticize their testimony and ministry. But it also includes their wives, verse 11. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. They need to be faithful. Now, again, doesn't mean perfect. But they're women who are faithful to the Lord, faithful in their marriages, faithful in their family, faithful in their local churches of work. They're people of integrity again. Now, as we think of that, go to 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter time, some will depart from the faith. Now, how can you depart from something you never had? Giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons as spirits are behind false teaching, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Do you know, you think of the conscience, your conscience is like those lights on your dash in your car. You ever have them flashing on? Or they're just on? I've had them on for a year and a half. <laughs> they just are there and it's like, well, that's nice doesn't mean anything to me. I'm not responding to the light, as it were. But you see, when you have a scripture-filled, spirit-directed conscience, you become sensitive to things. You see, as it were, the flashing light. And you say, the Lord's warning me here, don't go down this path. Can I, in a clear conscience, do that? And if you cannot do it before the Lord now, why do you think you're going to hear well done when you stand before the Lord later? You're not. Now, I say that because sometimes the compromising believer is actually viewed as the one who's applauded. Oh, he's gracious. No, he's not gracious. He's a compromiser. There's a big difference. When you compromise the word of God, when you compromise the will of God, that is ingraciousness. That's unfaithfulness. And while I think we need to walk by grace, obviously, and be gracious with people, we don't compromise the word of God and the will of God. And that's why our first responsibility is never to anyone else. It's always to the Lord. And here, this individual's have, their conscience are seared with a hot iron. Have you ever been seared with heat? Happened to me a number of years ago. I used to work for a roofing contractor many years ago, right out of high school. We were building the uh, swimming pool in, in Aurora. We were putting the roof on. And it was in the middle of January. It was very cold. And I was carrying these buckets of tar, heated, heated tar. And for some reason, it splashed and it hit my... My, uh, my arm, but I had, a, I had a coat on, but it went right down my, into my glove, and to this day, I have a major scar right here. And if I take a little pin and I stick it right there, guess what? I don't feel anything. Why? Because I'm scarred. And what happens is when we violate our conscience over and over again, pretty soon we build up scar tissue in our soul, and we become insensitive. Our conscience gets seared with a hot iron. It, the lights aren't going off anymore because we violate it time and time again. And that's why you might say to a believer who's lived in carnality and has been second in the world, doesn't that bother you? And they're like, bother me about what? Because their conscience has been seared with a hot iron. You say, well, how do you get rid of a guilty conscience? Well, at salvation, you get rid of it through the blood of Jesus Christ. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? That's how you get it cleansed. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but 
the blood of Jesus, right? And as a believer, when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and we start walking by faith again. And so we see here that faithfulness is critically important to God. He wants to reward you for your faithfulness. He wants to make you a faithful woman, a faithful man of God. But they're in the minority. But his grace is available. His grace can do it. Would you let him do it? And when you fail, would you just be honest about it? Confess your sin, look to the Lord again, and keep on moving. Would you allow the Spirit of God to take the Word of God to build into your conscience the norms and standards of Scripture so that you develop a sensitive conscience, that you can have a good conscience, that you can say, what I just did there, I have a good conscience before the Lord above. And I can wait actually till the judgment seat of Christ for the day to declare it. But I'm humble enough to realize I can deceive myself so that I'm willing even to take correction because I have blind spots and I don't always see it the way it should be. And you know what? That kind of attitude, God says, you know what? Not only will there be conditional blessings in time, as it were, but I will give you a reward at the judgment seat of Christ. And by God's grace, may that be true of you. And may that be true of Father, thank you again for your wonderful word and the opportunity to look into the scriptures today. And Father, I just pray that through this, we indeed might be challenged about being faithful. We might be encouraged that by your grace, we could be faithful. May we realize that one day we will give an account to you. And we know that even when it comes to being cleansed from a conscience regarding dead works that could not save us, to now serve the living and true God, the solution is the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for dying and shedding your blood, for paying for our sins, to dying as our substitute. Thank you that you ever live now to make intercession for us. Thank you that you are building your church. Thank you that one day, You who are faithful and true will come back and set up your kingdom because you are faithful and you've made these promises. And Father, thank you that the faith rest life is even available to us to walk by faith in you because you are faithful. And thank you that even when we screw up, and we do, that you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we confess. And so, Father, I just pray that in our heart of hearts today, as we've been hearing your word, we would say, by your grace, Lord, I would want to be faithful. I would like to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I would like to have a reward, not in order to peacock around heaven, but in order to cast my crown at the feet of the Lord Jesus out of thankfulness and gratitude for his amazing grace. And should someone be here, dear Father, who's never yet been saved, Father, I pray that today they would understand it's not by works of righteousness we have done. It's according to your mercy you save us by your incredible grace. The moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we receive him, and thus we are born again, born from you because of what you do for us, not because of what we've ever done for you. So we thank you now. For all of this, in Jesus' name.